org slash lives if it's this reminds me of the early days of the space mission you know shooting a mark you know <laughs> you know you have to count down you know and all of a sudden you can't launch it because the clouds are coming in é, é. Ah, já estamos ao vivo já estamos ao vivo já estamos transmitindo uh... A, a, a nossa sala está bastante colorida hoje, bastante viva, bastante alegre. Nós temos uma presença muito grata. Uh, thank you very much, John, uh, uh, for accepting our, our invitation. Uh, e hoje, uh, uh, antes de começarmos a conversar com o John Mad Dog Hall, uh, essa figura tremenda do... Ah, ok, 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 uh, uh, áudio duplicado, <laughs> sorry, uh, let me see our chats, uh, não sei se o pessoal já está ouvindo, mas enfim, essa aqui é a live de segunda número 81, uma live especialíssima com a presença do John Mad Dog Hall, é uma, pessoa, uma pessoa bastante ativa e conhecida não só pela, pela sua participação na, na, nas várias comunidades do, do software livre e do open source, mas também pela figura humana que é e pela participação e, pela, e pelas histórias que tem para contar da própria história recente da computação, né? a, a história que interessa para a gente, a história do, do mundo dos hackers dos anos 60 e 70, que a gente adora escutar. Todo mundo ouvindo bem por aí no chat, qualquer coisa só dá um toque. A, a transmissão está sendo feita, como todos sabem, lá pelo nosso site, da, da, na nossa página, uh, debxp.org lives, mas também no endereço do Odyssey, que é onde, por onde nós transmitimos agora as nossas lives. Uh, já temos aqui algumas pessoas assistindo, isso é bom. Uh, se puderem avisar o pessoal também lá no Telegram, parece que a Bárbara Tostes pediu para a gente avisar lá no Telegram uh, quando, quando começasse a live. E eu não vou, eu não vou me prolongar muito, porque to todos aqui querem ouvir o Mad Dog falar. O que eu vou dizer para vocês é que sobre a live da semana passada, eu ainda estou fazendo a legendagem em português, eu preciso dar esse aviso a vocês, estou em mais ou menos aí um terço, porque é um trabalho enorme fazer esse tipo de legenda, mas todos terão como assistir em português, com as legendas em português, em breve. E quando elas forem lançadas, o pessoal aqui já se mobilizou, já está se mobilizando para fazer legendas em espanhol também, e até o, o, a, a, as legendas em inglês também. E assim a gente vai ampliando um pouco a visibilidade dessa conversa da semana passada, que foi sensacional, foi muito inspiradora para todos nós. Ok? Então, sem me prolongar muito, eu vou passar para o Creteu fazer a introdução dele aí, para iniciar já o nosso papo. O, o, se o Juca e o, 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 a Lívia, o Kobe e o Aloysio quiserem falar alguma coisa, o Simplex também, nessa abertura, seja assim algo que seja super breve, e daí a gente já passa para as perguntas das, dessa noite. Olha lá, já temos retorno, Leandro Ramos, valeu, Leandrão. Cretinho, contigo. Ok. Good evening, everyone. Lívia, Aloysio, Colby, Simplex, Juca, Mad Dog. Today is a special day, and thank you, Blau, again, for the opportunity. So, This guy, I met him at 2005 or 2006. The most pictured guy that I ever had, I ever met. So this is not a Santa, but like Santa, this guy is nice, friendly, and kind guy. So welcome, Mad Dog, to our talk. I'm very glad to be here. Mais alguém? É, Juca, quer, quer fazer, falar alguma coisa antes? Aloysio, Kobe, Lívia, Simplex. Ok, então, Aloysio, é contigo. Pode comandar aí o show a partir de agora. Né? O Aloysio está sendo treinado para me substituir. Pode falar isso para ele aí. <risos> uh, hi, John. It's a, a real honor to, to talk to you. 
uh, I met you in 2019 in the EPCONF and it was an honor and it's now even more of an honor to be with all these people and talking to you. Uh, the first question that we we heard that they want, we wanted to ask you is related to what Kretschio just said. Such a warm person, such a, a pleasant person to talk and to listen to. And his nickname is Mad Dog. So uh, uh, why Mad Dog? Well, you're looking at somebody who is now over 70 years old. But when I was 27, I was not very nice to know. I was not very sure. And I often was. Uh, I had no problem in letting people know how unhappy I was with é só para mim que está. Desculpe, sorry, sorry. É... Para você Can também. Yeah. Yes. O áudio yes. também está bagunçado para vocês, não é? Yeah. Yes. We had some problems. The, the, the sound is like cutting. Uh, yes. The sound is not. Right. I thought it was my my. But it seems okay. It seems Let like now it's better. Yeah, now it's okay. I think. Can Can you talk some? Yes, I can talk. Yeah, now it's much now better. It's perfect. Yes. Much better. Thank you. Sorry okay. for the interruption. Thank you. No. Maybe I will lean forward a little bit more and turn my microphone up a little bit. Okay, so I, at the age of 27, I was not very much in control of my temper. And I was teaching at a small two-year technical college. I never liked the students but sometimes I would lose my temper with the administration of the school. And in one particular time, I was talking with the Dean of Instruction, who was my immediate supervisor, and we had a disagreement about the proper way of teaching students. Um, the conversation got louder and louder, so eventually the entire school could hear our conversation. And the students were all tiptoeing around because they didn't want to get caught in the middle of this. The dean fired me five times in one day. Fortunately, he hired me back six times in one day. <laughs> And after it was all over, um, I eventually won. But what I learned was that sometimes when you win the battle, you may lose the war. And so. The dean was British, and my students said that the conversation was too hot for mad dogs and Englishmen. And of course, the famous Noel Coward play of mad dogs and Englishmen, where the Englishmen in Hong Kong would stand out in the noonday sun, frying in the temperature, while the Chinese would all sit in the shadows in the shade. So the only two types of creatures out in the noonday sun with these crazy British and mad dogs. So I got named Mad Dog because the dean was British. And um, after that, I kept the name to remind me to never lose my temper again. I still have the temper. I still feel it inside of me, but I keep it inside of me. I've learned how to not have ulcers, how to not let, how to, how to keep the anger in here rather than in other parts of my body. Um, I practiced for a long time Zen Buddhism. And so a lot of that has helped me over the years. For example, I can go to sleep in less than 30 seconds, no matter you know, what the situation is. And um, so that's why I don't, you know, I have this name Mad Dog. I want to be continually reminded not to lose my temper. Uh, I also uh, am very happy that when I'm in Brazil, I'm known as Papa Noel. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, one of the first times I went to Sao Paulo, I was going to a favela. To, because the Four Linux company was uh, having some classes there for the, the people in the favela about how to use computers. As we were walking into the main building of the community center, I heard these, these tiny little voices going, 
Papai Noel, Papai Noel. <laughs> and I looked up, and at the top of the building, there was this kind of a fenced-in playground, and all the students were pressed up against the fence, yelling, Papai Noel. <laughs> so that's not a bad person to be known as. Definitely not. É, a Luísa pergunta para ele, por favor, se ele conhece a monja Coen, que é uma monja brasileira muito conhecida aqui, monja, monja zen budista. Sim. Uh, Blau is asking, uh, because you're talking about Zen meditation, if you know Monja Cohen here from Brazil? The name is familiar, but I'm, I'm sorry I don't. She's, she, she got very known, uh, like, more recently, some years from now. And uh, she, she's, she has an important role, like, spreading knowledge about Buddhism and Zen meditation and things related to that in Brazil. And it's interesting. She's like... We had this uh, in other parts of the world in the 60s, in the 70s, like trying to bring the Eastern culture, right? And she's kind of doing this at this time here in Brazil. Not only, but mainly mainly her. That's I, I actually have three friends of mine, which I didn't really convert them. But after talking with them, they joined the Buddhist uh, philosophy. It's not a religion. It's a philosophy. Hmm. Okay. Do we have another question? Um, I have more. a comment. <laughs> I have a comment about the, the one many you've more. just answered. Uh, because uh, many many years ago, in the first time I've heard you would be attending University of São Paulo to give a, a talk, uh, I was super happy. Uh, and then I, I I was there in the room, and and I saw that the room got filled up, and there was like more people than. It would fit in the room and I started getting annoyed that I saw one person not allowing any anybody else to enter the room anymore uh, because it was like uh, beyond capacity and I, I got really annoyed and I went there and argued and lost my temper because <laughs> because I was really annoyed that people wanted to see you and that person was not allowing you, people to see you And it, it was really a frustration <coughs> to me to see that situation. And and I'm I'm really sorry that I lost my temper. So I, I kind of uh, uh, reflect upon what you just said. Uh, but but that, that that's what happened back then. And and the person who was blocking was actually the, the director of the ma mathematics and computer science department. Uh, so. I, I, I got really, really sad that I did that, and I'm sorry. And, and I also apologized to him afterwards. But yeah, uh, th that's my story about losing my temper and somewhat connected to you as well. <laughs> and in, in that particular case, it may not have been his fault. He may have been uh, trying to enforce rules of capacity. Exactly. That, that, you know, that was the case, yes. So, so you know. That's the other thing. When you lose your temper, sometimes you are missing the, the point. Bigger picture, yeah. Right. Uh, in my case, one time, uh, I, I was practicing not losing my temper, but I still have what most people consider to be a rather strong personality. And when I was at Digital Equipment Corporation, I had my uh, supervisor come up to me and say, You know, you have a very strong personality. I said, yes, I do. I understand that. He goes, well, there's a lot of your fellow managers who don't want to work with you because your personality is so strong. You have to work to lighten your personality, okay, which was very hard for me to do. Um, I eventually got to the point where Uh, the same managers who had complained to him about not wanting to work with me because of my strong personality came back and said, I really like working with Mad Dog. So you can do it. And the thing is that if you're not, if you've got a strong personality and people are not willing to work with you, then you are going to be the, you're going to be the loser. I mean, what my manager said to me is if you continue with the strong personality, if you don't address that problem, then I can't promote you. I can't recommend you for promotion. So you would stay at whatever level you are. So. <laughs> ok. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, first time I, I heard your your uh, this name, uh, Mad Dog Hall, I thought I thought that was a blues man's name because <laughs> <laughs> I, I play blue I play the blues. Uh, uh, and, and we and we here have. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, uh, Luiz. Aquela aquela frasezinha que está me faltando agora é, é que nós aqui pergun temos perguntado se as pessoas já experimentaram feijoada e caipirinha ou se ele prefere caipirinha ou cerveja. <risos> Isso é importante para a gente poder começar a falar de assuntos sérios, né? Uh, sorry. Uh, did you man. understand? That, uh, uh, Mad Dog was looking like as if he was understanding everything you're saying. But well, I, I, heard, I heard. I heard. I think I heard Caprihina. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? yeah. 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 Yeah, he was saying that uh, we, before we begin talking about the topics or whatever, before we really start the thing, uh, we always have to ask uh, if the guest, or I won't say guest, and if, well, the person uh, tried caipirinha and or feijoada and how was that, that, that experience? Oh, yes. I mean, I've, I've, I've been to Brazil, I don't know, maybe... 70 80 90 times i can't remember how long it's i started coming in 1995 and i would come two or three times a year to various events in brazil so yes i've had all the different types of brazilian dishes from the south you know where they tend to have more meat and things to the northeast and the north i've been to manaus so i've i've experienced almost all of the different types of Brazilian cuisines, cachaças, um, capitas, and all that, that type of stuff. And I'm part owner of a brew pub in Curitiba, Brazil, the Hop and Roll uh, Beer Club. And uh, we, we were also the first brew on premises place in all of Latin America. So there you can you can decide that you want to brew your own beer. You can go there, buy the materials, mix them together as you wish, change the recipe if you wish, brew the beer, and then two weeks later after it's fermented, go back and put it in bottles with your own label if you want to. So uh, I'm very... I guess that was the second part of the question, but I, I, don't, I don't think that I can ask that. It would be caipirinha or beer? Or bre brewed or distilled? better <laughs> um i like it all i mean you know it's uh you know there's very bad beer and there's very good beer and uh for example i i will not drink a budweiser even if it's given to me i it feel bad like... i can't say that on a family <laughs> show <laughs> I know what your answer is because you you said the answer to me when, when I gave you one. Uh, you you came to visit the Garoa Hacker Club, Hacker Space in São Paulo, and I gave you a beer and it was a Budweiser. You said you know what this tastes like. I said water. You said no, something else. <laughs> <laughs> so the first time I went to Amsterdam, I was with a friend of mine. We were on what we called the beer drinkers tour of Europe. And we went into, we, 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 we landed at the Amsterdam airport. We got a rental car. We drove to this little town. We went into a bar and my friend said, I'll have a Heineken. And the bartender looked at him and said, you must be an American. <laughs> my friend said, yes. Why? He says, because only Americans ask for Heineken that way. We call it the green death. <laughs> <laughs> and come to find out heineken in holland is like budweiser is in the united states it's the every person's beer so you know when when heineken wanted to come to the united states they said oh are we going to advertise it like budweiser and miller and all those we'll need a lot of advertising money it's going to be hard to fight that or We can simply say we are a premium imported beer. And for a fraction of the advertising money, mostly word of mouth, they just walked right in and took over the market. And even today, people think of Heineken as a premium beer. And I think that it's even lower than Budweiser. <laughs> so, 
you know, it has this terrible aftertaste. And um, I, I won't drink a Heineken either. I won't. I won't. Not when there's so many good beers that you can have. And the same thing is true of cachaça. You can have really good cachaças. You can have really poor cachaças. Yes. Right? So yeah. it really depends on the, the, the craft. Uh, I, I would like to ask Blau to perhaps show the bottle again that you showed ah, last week. Yeah, my bottle, my bourbon. My favorite bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> let let me find the camera. <laughs> Do you know that drink, this drink? Oh yes, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I I've never I've never really experienced that one, but uh, <laughs> so I've, I've I've been trying to get Hop and Roll to buy a micro distillery, and uh, uh, you know, because these days stills can be. They, they come in kit form. You can actually build them as a kit. And because grain alcohol or any type of distilled alcohol starts off the same way that beer does as taking grain, you ferment it, you get the, the beginning of the alcohol out of it, and then the distilling process gets rid of the excess water and leaves the alcohol. Um, you can have boutique um, you know, liquor. And I just, they just haven't gotten around to it yet. So we did have 29 taps uh, of craft beer there at, at Hop and Roll. They just moved to a new building. They're going to have even more taps. So I'm looking forward to going down there and seeing the new building and their new facilities. They're very excited about it. Do we have to pay you as advertising for this? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't okay. think Blau will mind, but no, I don't have to. I don't think you have to. Okay. But you won't mind. We, we, we accept IPA. Yeah, he would. I, I, I did, I did okay. drink uh, his IPA on uh, that the IPA. conference. Yeah, I know. I know, I, I, I know what he's talking. I know what he's talking about. But you know, IPA is only one type of beer. You know, there's so many different types. There's porters, there's stouts, there's rye, so many different grains. We accept it's all just, of them. It's like, <laughs> well, it's like, it's like cooking. It's like cooking. Yeah. I mean, you always, you, you use some of the basic ingredients, but you mix them together in different ways to create all these different things. And that's one of the things I like about it. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like software. You know, software is so many ways to do the same thing. I mean, Pearl, they used to call the Swiss army knife of, of, of computing, right? They say, well, how should I do this? Well, there's so many different ways you can do it, right? So that's, Everywhere. you know, it's, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a creative <laughs> portion of humans. Well, I hear you guys saying about beer and I feel like you're talking uh, you're speaking Chinese because I really, <laughs> well, <laughs> in fact, I can get what they say, but I really do not understand anything about beer. Um, I, I am not really a beer guy. I prefer uh, wines and... Oh, don't tea. get me started on wine. <laughs> you have but, to take the whole thing. But even, even, uh, even though I really respect that there are so many types of beer and i would like to to taste them but i don't know i don't know if i could really uh, uh take more than one shot i think <laughs> but well i'm so eager to um ask you a question that we have here from our audience oh. um which is can you tell us a bit about uh, years, uh, the early years, getting involved with computers. You were you were talking something before uh, our transmission, and it was really really nice the stories you were you're telling us. And I think you should share this with our audience right now. Okay, well, the first computer I ever programmed was at a company called the Western Electric Company, and they manufactured the hardware for the telephone system, the AT&T telephone system. So they made the telephones, they made the wire, they made the telephone, you know, the, the switching systems and things like that. That's what Western Electric did. 
And when I was a university student, I belonged to a cooperative education program where I would go to work for six months and I would go back to school for six months and then work for six months and back to school for six months. And I could not graduate unless I was successful in my co-op program. I was actually graded for that. So one day I was there and they came around and they said, oh, we have this correspondence course. You know, there's all these different correspondence courses. Would you like to take one? They're free. Why not? So I looked through them and there was this correspondence course, how to program the IBM 1130 computer in Fortran. Wow. Now, this is Fortran spelled with all capital letters, okay? None of this crappy Fortran with a capital F and then little lowercase letters. Not Fortran 2, Fortran 4, Fortran 77, Fortran 90, high-performance Fortran, or any of those Fortrans. This was Fortran. That and being able to punch cards was all that anything would anything anybody would ever need. And the IBM 1130 computer had... 4,000 16-bit words of memory. And when you wrote your program, you linked all the device controllers into your program. And then you would boot your program and it would run inside the machine. There was no operating system. So if you wanted to talk to the printer, you said print. And the, the line had to go all the way out to the line printer and would be printed. And then your program would start up again. There was no double buffering or anything like that. You print. If you were reading cards of data, you'd read the card and maybe you want to print it out. It was read card, print printer. Read card, print printer. Okay. And so I read the book. I learned how to program. They had uh, two, two programmers there and a, an operator who would help answer my questions and stuff like that as I went along. But I learned how to program this machine. And we had maybe 400 engineers there of all different types, mechanical, electrical, things like that. None of them knew how to program this computer. And yet this 19-year-old college kid learned how to program it by reading a book and practicing. So more and more, as I came back from He's holding up something, programming the IBM 1130. Look at that. Okay. Hughes. Yes. I actually <laughs> knew Mr. Hughes. So, you know, I, I learned to program this thing. And uh, over, over the years, I did less and less electrical engineering, which is what I was going to university for, and more and more programming until I finally said, you know, I'm really interested in this. I'm going to switch my, my career, my education at the school and go into that. Now, in the meantime, I was, I was walking around the school, Drexel University, and I found this little laboratory that had some of these desktop computers. So the IBM 1130 that I described was maybe eight foot long. It had a five megabyte hard disk pack in it that you put your data and your, your programs on. You only had one hard disk at a time in the system. And, um, you know, that was, it, it cost, I, I don't even know, probably about $150,000 or so. But they had these little desktop computers from this company called DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, and they were only $50,000. And you hooked it up to, an ASR33 teletype, a hard copy terminal that read data and printed data at the amazing speed of five characters per second. Okay. So if you had a 3,000 character program and you were reading this at five characters a second, it took 600 seconds to read your program into memory or to print it out you know, 10 minutes, okay? That's if your program is 3,000 characters long. If you're going to assemble your 3,000 character program, you had to make at least two passes of the source code. The first pass to create the simple table, the second pass to do the rest of the assembly and to print out your object code, and maybe a third pass to create your listing. 
So that was three times 10 minutes or 30 minutes to get one turnaround of your assembled code. It was slow by today's comparisons, but it was still faster than using hand calculators and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that machine had a very, very simple instruction set of you know machine language instruction set. It only had uh, basically eight different instructions, zero through seven. And two of those instructions were used for input output. One did output, one did input. The other instructions were things like do an add, add something from, from memory to a register, or store something from the register to memory and zero out the register. So when I say the register, that's all because it only had one register, <laughs> one general purpose register. It had a stack pointer, it had a program counter. So there was three registers. But the machine was so simple that it couldn't subtract. It could only add. And so if you wanted to subtract, you had to take the two's complement of the subtrahend and add that to the menu end. And that gave you your answer, assuming you didn't have an overflow, which you had to test for. So, you know, it was very difficult. Well, that wasn't difficult. It was easy to program it in one way because the instructions were so simple, you could remember them in your head. But it was difficult because you had to do everything. Mm -hmm. And multiplication was repeated additions and, and shifting. Uh, div dividing was re repeated subtractions and shifting. And uh, so, and then converting from the character format into something which was a, a, a binary number, so you could actually add it or subtract it, even that was very hard to do. And so I learned this assembly language. And then when I went to learn other languages like C and C++ and things like that, it was a lot easier for me to, re to, to understand because I said, oh, this is a pointer. I understand that. I know what a pointer is. Mm -hmm. This is what happens if you dereference a null pointer. I could understand why that was so horrible. <laughs> okay. And, um, and so today I still recommend to people that sooner or later they learn some assembly language so they actually know how the machine works, you know, and don't just stick with uh, upper level language like Python or things like that, but, because it just becomes a lot harder to understand the, all these other languages. And, and that's uh, kind of the contrary of, of what uh, we've, we've been seeing in schools, like people are like learning to work with frameworks and things that is very specific and that changes every year and they do not know what's uh, behind it in what's low level. I feel that a lot. You know, the, 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 I, I really feel sorry for a lot of professors in universities because, you know, I, I, I told you about what it was like when I first started programming, right? Security, computer security was locking the door at night before you went home. Graphics was printing out ASCII art on the line printer of Snoopy lying on top of a doghouse or, the, or this woman sitting on a stool with strategically placed dollar signs and things like Beautiful. that, okay? And networking was carrying a box of cards down the hallway <laughs> to your friend. So, you know, you know audio, I mean, we... We didn't even we didn't even dream of audio, okay? And so you know, there's a lot less to learn before you can get started. We weren't doing computer science. There wasn't even a computer science degree until about 1977. We were doing computer black magic. We were stumbling in the dark. And you know, and that's why. People like Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie were just like so far beyond the curve when they were developing the Unix system. And they said, we really want to make the kernel, the interfaces to the kernel as simple as possible and have the majority of the functionality that people are going to use in the libraries outside of the kernel. Do not 
put that functionality inside the kernel because it only makes the kernel more unstable, you know, more likely to crash. Try and keep the state the, the kernel as simple as possible. And 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 people say to me, well, Mad Dog, the Linux kernel is not simple. But if you try to if you try to put all of the functionality of the libraries inside the kernel, you'd really be lucky to have it stay up. The, the example you said before, when every program you had, uh, you had to like put everything when you wanted to run the program, it was almost like every program was an operating, an operating system on itself. It was. Like it was. Yeah. But, but again, remember that when you started to run that program, there was no there was no parallelism. If something at all. breaks, it all breaks. Well, and, and there was no parallelism, right? If you were reading a card, you had to stop mm -hmm. and wait for that card to come in from the mechanical card reader into the system. And if you wanted to print, you had to wait for that print line to go out to the printer and free up the buffer so you could put the next print line in there. And so your programs were limited. When they when people got around to saying, well, we're going to have a spooling system. So we, you know, over here, we'll be reading in all these cards and putting them on this really fast device called a disk, you know, get that all in. And now we can allow the computer to read the stuff off the disk much faster than it was reading it off of a physical card reader. Or we're going to spool all of this data out to the disk and allow the printer program to just take that, you know, keep doing that while the main CPU is still busy doing computation. These, you know, we've been around this for so long, we think, oh yeah, this naturally this makes sense. But you know, looking at it from 1968 or 1962 on up, it didn't, you know, it had to be done. And somebody had to write the code and somebody had to make it work. You know, things like multi-threading. I remember a time when the libraries in Unix were not multi-threaded. You could, you know, you would have to block every time your the thread of your program started to go into a library if some other thread was already using it, you had to block and wait for that to come out. And uh <laughs> It, it brings up a conversation I've had with Linus one time. I um, I try to stay away from giving Linus technical advice because I figured there's already hundreds of people giving him technical advice, and I I'm more I'm more of a friend of Linus than anything else. Right? I'm Linus's friend. I'm the godfather of his children. I like going to his house. I like having a beer with him or a wine with with his wife, Tuve, you know? And we hardly ever talk about Linux. We talk about steam engines and ranking stock because he's a physicist major, people forget that. You know, we talk about all these other things other than Linux. But one day I was at Digital and I said, you know, wow, the Linux kernel is, doesn't do soft real time very well. So I called him up. He was a transmitter at the time, and I'm having this conversation with him. I said, Linus, if you could somehow separate out more of the kernel so that you could tell people if you stick in this path, you will have soft real time. And we could sell a lot more systems. And he goes, what do you mean? Linux, Linux is already real time. I says, how can you say that, Linus? He goes, well, if I'm playing Quake and the monster has a gun in his hand and I press the button and I shoot the monster, you know, the monster will die. That's real time. I said, Linus, put a real gun in that monster's hand and see if you think the same. <laughs> and there was silence on the other end of the phone. He says, okay, you convinced me. <laughs> and in the, next, in the next version, in the next version of Linux, the Linux kernel, Soft build time was very much improved. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's the, the secret of soft build time is that you have to be able to complete what you want to complete in a known period of time. That's it. 
you know, if you need it to be done faster, you get a faster CPU, but you have, you can't block for an uneven amount of time because you can't, you don't know that something's going to be done. And what was happening was that there were hor some horrible device drivers that were in there. And if you had that thread go into that device driver, you weren't sure when it was going to come out, at least when as far as a computer was concerned. You know, it might come out in half a second. It might come out in three quarters of a second. But in a real-time world, that is forever. There was a great Star Trek episode on recently where Data, the android in Star Trek, said that he was almost tempted to join with the Borg. And when the captain said, you were tempted? For how long? Data says, 0. 0.68321 seconds. He says, but to an android, that's almost forever. <laughs> when you say, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, go on, Joker. Uh, when I, you say I, that, <laughs> please be my guest. <laughs> live, okay. live long and prosper. <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask about sharing of source code uh, before it was a common practice to have licenses like the ones we have nowadays. And especially if you could elaborate on the cover of this famous book about the Unix source code, sure, uh, where there's people uh, photocopying at, at, at a Xerox machine, right, mm -hmm. uh, source code, and mm -hmm. how much of that is real, and what what was it like to share source code in that time frame? Well, first of all, that book is extremely real. That picture is extremely real. Um. Closed source code is the newcomer. Because in the early days, like I said, there was a company might build a computer. They might make a couple copies of it. But then there was something new in the architecture or there was something that was going to make it cheaper. So they would redo it again. There were all these different architectures, instruction sets and stuff, because people were still trying to figure it out. We didn't know. Okay. So most of the programs were either written in assembly language, or if you did have a high level compiler, you got the source code and they were compiled onto that particular architecture. So computers had gone from 1943 or 44, when you had computers like the Colossus that was at Bletchley Park, was one of the first digital computers. And the Mark I and Mark II at Harvard, those were all programmed external to the memory of the computer. They used paper tape that held the programs and stuff like that, that controlled the machine. Uh, there was actually a drive shaft in the Mark I and Mark II that would turn three times every second. So the cycle time was one third of a second. And, you know, but so when people wrote programs for them, they wrote programs that they were distributing the source code for those programs. And when you got to, when you did have a high level compiler, so the first high level compilers. There was one that Grace Barry Hopper wrote that was called Flowmatic. And then from Flowmatic came out the COBOL, pro, the COBOL project. And then, um, oh, crap, I'm having a mental blank. The, the Forrester wrote Fortran. And, you know, and had those. And those were the two basic high level compilers of the day. They were in the 1950s. So there was a significant period of time that before you had a high level language. But even then, the computers, the number of computers were relatively small. It wasn't worth taking these programs and putting them into a binary only form and trying to sell them. So that came about when people said, I'm going to start selling my programs. But even then, the number of programs sold because the number of computers are relatively small and they charge a huge amount for those programs, a huge amount. People, and end, there was no copyright or patents applied to software, at least in the United States. So copyrights and patents only came about in the early 1980s, you know, 
a long time after computers and software were being created. So the way you protected your intellectual property was through contract law. As I said, you got these you got these lawyers together and product managers together and stuff like that, and you argued about the contract. You argued about how many computers you could put the program on, how many people could use them, and things like that. You came up with a amount of money you're going to pay, and then you got the program. And typically, you got the source code. Maybe it was kept in escrow, or maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't care. So that, you know, because the contract law said you could put it on this many computers. And where you had to have the EULA come out, the end user license agreement, was when you started manufacturing those programs like cookie cutters and putting them into floppy disks, you know, eight inch floppy disks, you know, and sending them out to stores to be sold because you couldn't afford to spend months getting this contract down for a piece of software you want to sell for a couple hundred dollars, right? So, you know, binary only software was actually, I mean, did people distribute some software in binary? Sure, because there were maybe, I think about 50,000 PDP-8 computers created. So yeah, some people could write, write software binary only form for that, but most people didn't see it, that, you know, and, and the other thing was they weren't professional programmers. What do I mean by that? They were physicists, they were chemists, they were doctors, they were educators. They did not write software for their main living. They wrote software to solve their own problems. And after they got finished writing that software, they said, well, what am I gonna do with this, right? I could try and sell it, sure, but I'm not in that business. I'm not in the business of writing software. And so they gave it away to things like Dicas and Share from IBM and Brainstorm from Novell, and they distributed it. And maybe those people who got it, you know, would say, hey, that's a pretty good program, you know. And I go to a Dicas meeting and I find the guy that wrote it and I says, hey, that was a great program. And I've made some changes to it. And would you like to have those changes? And I, oh, sure. Because now I've just doubled my programming staff. It used to be just me, and now I've got another one. <laughs> and then when somebody come up to you and say, well, hey, I'm not a programmer, but your program really helped me out. You know, let me buy you a beer or a glass of wine or, you know, or something like that. Or let me buy you dinner or let me give you a job. And all of these reasons are a lot of the reasons that people write free software today, you know. And to learn things because they were curious about these really interesting things called computers. I mean, think about it. Something that might be able to mirror the human mind. In, 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 in automobiles of today, instead of having a linkage, which, which goes from your brake pedal, presses out to your four wheels, and they never, they never tighten up at the same time, that was replaced by hydraulics, but today is replaced by a microcomputer. When you press down on that, that brake pedal, there's no physical thing that connects that brake pedal with your four wheels. Instead, there's a microprocessor. So there's a nee, 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 nee. put on put on your brake like this. You know, is your tire skidding on the road? If it is, it's no, you're not slowing down as fast as you could because your tire is skidding. You've got to keep your tire stable against the road. Because if it's skidding, you're not stopping. That's ABS, right? Yes, ABS, absolutely. And as we move towards electric cars, it's only going to get worse or better, as the case may be, because now you're, you're going to be we it's going to be electricity driving the wheels. And you're going to do dynamic braking of each wheel. You'll be putting electricity back into the battery. You're not going to need you're not going to need a differential. You're not going to need a transmission. The whole car gets lighter. Now, of course, you get batteries. They're going to be heavier, but you know all this stuff. But that microprocessor is key to all of this. And do you see any chance of free software in electric cars? Yeah, absolutely. So, so this this is actually a, a good segue 
because there, this is a modern day thing that I, I want to bring out, make people know. We talk about free and open source software. Open source being licenses like MIT, Berkeley, stuff like that. Why did these schools create the MIT and the Berkeley license, right? It's because they had to. Because the law had been changed so that when you write any code, it's automatically copyrighted. It belongs to you or it belongs to somebody. And if you don't have a license, but you use that code, somebody could come back later and sue you and say, hey, I wrote that code and you're using it and I didn't give you my permission to use it. Therefore, I can sue you. So the University of California, Berkeley said, oh, well, we're going to create this license and we'll put it with the code and say, yeah, we the copyright holders, we understand we own this code, but here is your license to use it and do what you want to with it. With in certain, you know, you can't hold us re responsible if something goes wrong, da, 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 da. but there's no requirement for you to take your changes and pass those along to the end user. Not in MIT, not in Berkeley, not in the artistic license, not in any other license that's open source, except for one, the GPL copy left that's the one that has the thing that says oh you have to pass on your changes to the end user well you have to make them at least available to them and so open source is wonderful for makers of software because you get to take all this other stuff that people have worked on and collaborated, got to work and tested and stuff like that. You get to use that because it's open source. But when you generate your binaries that go out to your users, oh, you don't have to pass on your changes. You can keep those to yourself. And so you know, the end user can go back to the open source code, they can bring it down, they can compile it, they can, they can try and duplicate your compilation chain and things like that. But they'll never get what you produced because they don't have the changes you made. And that's the biggest difference between open source and free software. And there are certain companies who I, who are named nameless, but their name rhymes with Microsoft, who say they love open source, but they never say they love Linux. They never say they love free software. They say they love open source. And Oracle and Adobe, they all love open source, because why not? You know? So that's, that's a difference. There really is this difference between open source and free software. And for years and years, I tended to think of them about the same, but Richard Stallman convinced me a long time ago that free software was the way to go. And, uh, you know, I don't spit on people that, that create open source. I don't even spit on people to create closed source because it's their right. They created the software. As long as they obey the licenses of, of where they got the software from, it's their choice. And could you could you uh, locate when uh, and where did that change happen in your mindset? Like when you said, "Okay, the the way to go is soft." Do you relate that to something? To some moment? Well, yes, my, yes. My choice. Yes, yes. I don't know. I think it was an evolution, a little bit like uh, Barack Obama had with gay people. He evolved. <laughs> um, I can tell you that some of it was because of the drawer full of calculators I have that are all no, not, no, no good anymore or, or, or phones I brought in the early days that I can't use anymore because the company has lost interest in supporting it or pieces of hardware, you know, graphics cards and stuff that no longer work because people lost, the companies lost interest in them. Um, I just kept getting more and more pissed off about it. So, mm -hmm. uh, but it, there was definitely a time where I, and I, you know, again, I'd like to, I like the BSD people 
you know, I I don't I don't spit on them because of what they do. But I just I just want people to be upfront about the differences, you know, to be when truthful say, about them. When you say that the way to go is free software, uh, it seems to me that you're saying the way to go is copy left. That is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. A copy left or a copy left like license where mm -hmm. the end user where the developer is forced to make their changes and in, in GPL 3.0 and, and, and beyond, they're not only forced to make their changes, but they're forced to say what steps they went through to build their code. Here is my build chain. Right, because it, it it makes a difference what compiler you used and what libraries you you linked against and all the rest of that stuff it, you know it makes a difference to do that and does this does this affect your business model yes it will because you can't just go in and sell a license for 20 million dollars because somebody will clone it and you know charge 19 million dollars but you can make a business plan based around that. And there's plenty of companies that have who have a business plan around free software. And they make a lot of money. Because here's the next thing about this. And you can sit back in your chair because it's really going to disturb you. Nobody ever buys a computer. Nobody ever buys software. Ever. What they're buying is a solution. Buying a computer? Uh, someday, I'm going to use that computer as a boat anchor. I'm going to tie a rope to it. I'm going to toss it overboard, just like a boat anchor. But you know something? A boat anchor will be better than that computer because the anchor will hold my boat in place and the computer will just be dragged along on the bottom of the ocean. They're buying a solution to a problem. And maybe that problem is just that they want to play a game. That's fine. But maybe they could use two tin cans with a string tied between them to play that game. It's just like with the car brake pedal, it's better to use a computer than the two tin cans with a string. And when you start thinking about it that way, then people are buying a solution and they really don't care where the hardware inside is open source, closed source, you know, whatever, as long as the solution works. I, I'm sorry. I would disagree that it is better. It is better in maybe a useful way, like a, a, a measurable way, like avoiding accidents. I would agree with that. But uh, would you say that it's better, period? Like, some, for example, your example, like talking about brakes. Uh, some people would prefer the feeling of have uh, having a, a, a mechanical car, uh, like a 90s or an 80s car, just like an instrument, a musical instrument. You prefer? Uh, uh, do you understand? Like you can, you can emulate that. Did you, did you ever? Did you, did you ever drive a Model T Ford? No. Trust me, <laughs> you don't want to. Okay, because when you step down on that brake, unless all those gears and mechanisms are tuned exactly right. One wheel is going to lock up when the other wheel is still going, and the whole car is going to spin. That's what hydraulics did to satisfy that problem. However, hydraulics have this other problem that you, you know, you're panicking, you clamp down on that brake, and your brakes lock up, and you're actually going to stop slower. Now, if you say you like the feel of the brake, that's 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 a problem you can solve. You can put feedback mechanisms into that little brake pedal. So when you push down on it, there's a little, there's a little thing there that pushes back on the brake pedal. So, oh, you know, gives you a nice little vibration against the bottom of your foot, you know, makes you feel good. You go, ah, yeah, I really feel good about that, you know. But that is just a matter of implementation. The fact yeah, that the microprocessor is in there is better. In the very then, near future, we'll have cars that drive themselves uh, as a common thing, not as a like an interesting thing that some people have, but 
like every car will drive themselves and may, maybe maybe it, it may even become illegal to drive your own car and then people may say i like driving my car i want to drive my car even though i'm more dangerous to other people by driving my car it may not have to be illegal it'll just be too expensive so my first job was working for an insurance company I worked for Aetna Life and Casualty, the largest multi-line insurance company in the world. And we were the largest commercial user of IBM equipment in the world. We automatically ordered two of everything that IBM announced. <laughs> no salespeople had to come to us and say, would you like to buy this? No, no. IBM announced it. We automatically ordered two. <laughs> Didn't make any difference whether it was a $32,000 disk drive or a $2 million mainframe. Didn't make any difference. We bought two. And one of them went to our research department to figure out how we're going to use it. And the other one went down to the operations floor because we knew that sooner or later we were going to use it. So let's just put it in place. And when research tells us how to use it, we'll be all set to use it. That's the way we worked. And we had a half million, 500,000 magnetic tapes in our tape library on site with another 100,000 magnetic tapes in our tape library in a salt mine in Idaho for long-term storage. That's the type of company we were. And every single one of us had to take a one-week course in insurance. Why? Because <laughs> we were working for an insurance company. And we were expected to know about insurance, at least a little bit. So I learned this about insurance and actuaries. And I it's going to go like this. Here we have automated cars, and here we have people. And right now, automated cars may or may not be killing more people than people do. But as long as automated cars are killing more people than people do, well, no, nobody's going to say anything. You know, you, it's still going to be. But just as soon as people, more people are killed by people than automated cars, then things are going to change dramatically because there's this person named an actuary in the insurance company is going to say, you want to drive that car? Okay. But your insurance premium is going to go up dramatically because that computer doesn't get drunk. That computer doesn't fall asleep. That computer, you know, doesn't go faster than the speed limit because that computer does has no reason to go faster than the speed limit. And we are recognizing that there's more accidents with people at the controls than computers and almost overnight that's going to happen now what's the second thing that's going to happen i'll tell you 90 percent of the cars on the road are not on the road they're sitting there in the driveway in a garage in your house they're not going they're just sitting there rusting and believe me in new england we know about rust <laughs> so they're, they're, they're falling apart it's depreciating right and you know and so you say well geez you know i'd like to get rid of my car but i can't afford a taxi cab driver why can't you afford a taxi cab driver it's because of the taxi it's because of the taxi cab driver but if you replace that with autonomous car now look what happens particularly in a city those cars never stop they don't get tired. They don't have to go to the bathroom. They never have to eat, stuff like that. They just keep driving around. Every once in a while, they have to switch their batteries or charge or something like that. But they never stop. And so they just leave off somebody and pick somebody else up. Because they never stopped, you don't need parking places. You don't need garages. You don't need all that stuff. The number of cars shrinks dramatically. And because all those cars don't even bother going someplace until they know that there's a rider there, they're not just cruising around. They're actively taking somebody someplace or picking somebody up and taking them someplace. Mm -hmm. So all of this space 
is now returned to the city. And the number of cars we need is dramatically reduced. So maybe we only have 10% as many cars and they can still handle, you know, uh, rush hour and stuff like that. Maybe we get better at mass mass transportation because when you get to wherever you're going with the train or whatever, there's enough of these autonomous cars waiting to take you to the rest of the way. So that's what's going to happen. And you're not going to be spending the, you know, 5% or 10% of your, of your money that you earn every day in having to buy expensive cars. Yeah. Uh, I can see uh, computing as solutions to, but my concern is always about who, uh, in, in which hands are the control. That's my concern. Yeah. So which hands are the controls right now? Bolsonaro? <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, I'm not going to say anything more about that. I, I can say Trump, right? You know? Sure. And, um, you know, so what, gives, what, make, what makes you feel that, that, that <coughs> the control is in hands that you really want? I mean, free software maybe uh, uh, bring some of this control to our communities or our, our, our teams of, of uh, programmers uh, and even to our, our people uh, decision uh, decision making about what we want as society well i don't think that anything that we do here is going to stop the movement of computers into more and more stuff that we do because quite frankly they just become they, they're creating cheaper solutions all the time yeah if you tried to go back and create the mechanical car leakage for your brakes or the carburetor to, to to put the fuel into your engine or you know go back even it's it's cheaper to come up with electric windows that it is to put the window crank on your window. It is. You know, if everybody wanted electric windows, they would be cheaper than the mechanical ones. So, you know, th th these are things that people have to, to get used to in manufacturing. But I, um, I don't think we're going to stop that. But what we can stop, what we should stop, is closed source software driving this. Yes. That's so so now I'm going to tell you something that some of you may not be able to sleep later on tonight. I can because I studied Zen. But, <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you something, okay? So let's say you have, you have closed source software and you have open source software. Which one is more secure? This is the battle. This is the, the, the thing about, you know, which one is more secure, closed source or open source? It depends. Depends on what? Depends on the measures you take to assure the security of the system you're developing. Yeah. Uh, would you say that closed source is in general more secure because it's security through obscurity? Or would you say that it's open source is more secure? There's a risk in both. Uh, if you know you're hiding the source, you, you may be less compelled to take care of it because nobody's looking. But maybe the other way is also possible that that nobody's looking at free software at all. Well, and the other argument is that with free software, you can have many eyes looking at the source. That was always the argument. You know, many eyes make it more secure. And from my viewpoint, from my observation, neither one is inherently more secure. I worked for a company that made closed source software, Digital Equipment Corporation. And we might have only one engineer working on a particular module. Only their eyes really looked at the source code. Yes, every once in a while we had um, code reviews and stuff. But were the other engineers really looking at that code to try and really make it secure? I yeah, I feel, I feel the same. Uh, it, I, I think uh, roughly 10 years ago, I've been working on the Inkscape project as a core developer. And there's some stuff that I did there that I was not very sure it was correct. 
but I did it anyway because I was the only one working in, in that corner mm -hmm. of the source mm -hmm. code. Mm -hmm. And after many, many years, I went back to take a look and it's still there. And I'm still not sure if that's correct. And nobody touched that portion of the code. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really feel that uh, there's probably lots and lots and lots of source code that nobody okay. has ever reviewed. Okay, but now here's the other side of it, okay? There is no inherent, you know, goodness to open source versus closed source. However, that's mean time to failure. You know, how soon is it before somebody finds the bug that allows them in? The real issue is mean time to repair. That once you've found the bug and you understood the bug, how long does it take for you to generate the patch, get the patch out there to mm -hmm. all the people who need it? And the problem is, if you have an operating system that the company who created the closed source binary software, you know, they may know about that fix, they may know, but they've lost interest in that software and they are not going to fix it. And you don't have the capability of fixing it because you don't have the source code to allow you to do that. Now, I worked on this. I, I experienced this. At digital, we had an old operating system called Altrix that we had retired, and the Morris worm came out. And my management was not going to generate the patch to, to protect people against the Morris worm. And you know, Unix systems all over the United States were or all over the world were crashing right and left because of this. It was a simple fix if you had the source code. And I had to blackmail my management into fixing this. And there were so many times that I used, in effect, blackmail to get my management to do the right thing. Uh, upper management, when they found out, they said, yes, you did the right thing. But middle management was stuck. And for example, if your operating system was called XP, and all of a sudden you had a bug like Spectre or, you know, that type of a bug, you know, are you going to go back and fix it? And how many people were still using XP long after Microsoft retired it? My drawer full of phones and calculators and stuff that I cannot use because I don't have the source code. And people say, well, I don't have the expertise to fix it. Okay. Well, what if the 100,000 people who are still using XP got together as a group and say, hey, we'd like to hire some programmer to fix this for us because we need it. And we'll each chip in, you know, 10 bucks or 100 bucks to fix this problem. You know, that's $10 million. Somebody might be able to spend a couple of weeks fixing that problem, creating that patch for the XP system for $10 million. So, you know, I, I don't buy all these arguments of, you know, the end user can't fix this. The end user can't get together with a group and say, we'd like to fund this particular little improvement to the code that the developers don't have the time to do it we will fund somebody to do that. Uh, let me add something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. No, 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 I, I call you. <laughs> Hello, world. <laughs> Good night, another, another, another friend that John Mandog knows. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. And I, I'd like to add a comment about this discussion. I think everything uh, is related to an economic factor, right? And if you have a closed source software, uh, the the decision is made by the company if it's worth or not to, to do sure. something, for example, in an old software. If it's a free software, the society can uh, decide it. And I think it's more fair uh, for the humanity, the, the possible users. And also it's more sustainable, right? Because we don't need to, to rework on things that are already done. 
people spend lots of hours doing that. Why I would spend mine? And uh, I think everything uh, we should see, uh, I mean, the, the change we as activists want to see in the world, we need to, to also be guided by the economic factor. Because uh, regular people that don't know too much about technology, that, for example, uh, don't want or know about uh, controlling uh, the automation, etc., uh, they just want to use a solution, as you said. And if the best or more fair solution uh, is not cheaper than the, the, the regular one, the closed source one, they will choose the cheaper one. So the first thing I think we should work on is to make this change possible to everybody. And the economic factor is really important on this thing because uh, we usually are the, the early adopters of this ideas, technologies, but everybody needs to, to use it so we can make it available for uh, a cheaper price. I will disagree with you that the end subject, the end decision is in the company. I think the end decision is in the end user who they say, I'm simply not going to buy your product or your solution unless you make it open source, unless you make it free software. And okay, but what if the end user doesn't know about the difference between closed and open source? Uh, ah, but that's where we have to come in yeah. and educate them on that. You know, we have to show them. And what we could do is first target certain groups of customers, like the government, <laughs> the government should really put pressure on people providing them solutions to say, hey, we want you to make this free software because we're going to have to use the software for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. You know, what about elevators going up and down the building? And you say, well, you know, it's now a microprocessor that's controlling those, right? And <laughs> you, we're going to be, you know, so that that's going to be used for a long time. Airplanes, you're talking about a 20 or 30 year lifetime for airplanes. So I was in a typo. I'll bring this back to Brazil. I was in a typo doing one of the first Latino wares. And the president of a typo took me to the plant and showed me around, we're standing on top of the dam. And he said to me, and I said to him, this is very impressive. He said, yeah. I says, how long did it take you to build this? 20 years. I says, and how long is it gonna take you to pay off the bonds that made this? He goes, 50 years. I says, and how long is it gonna take it to really be worth it as a profit to building a typo that you could have done something else with that money to also bring in money to also benefit the Brazilian people. How long is it going to take? He said, a hundred years. I said, how long has the largest software in a company in the face of the planet been in existence? And he looked at me and he said, I understand what you're telling me. And after that, the typo started moving to using free software because the longest software company in existence was Microsoft. And they'd only been in existence at that point for 25 years. All these other companies who we always thought of that they'll never go out of business, Kodak, Enron, you know, Sears, you name it, they went out of business and Microsoft could go out of business or there could be some type of a nuclear attack and wipe out Redmond, Washington. And where are you going to find the programmers that know about producing Microsoft software to replace the software that has now been wiped out? That's why free software at least, at least open source, but more likely free software is so valuable because you spread that expertise across every country. You know, everybody 
can know it. Everybody can replace it. Free software is uh, a um, existence, a existential question, a point, a ex existential. I'm sorry, <laughs> my, uh, my, but uh, free software is a question of uh, the the very human uh, continuation, uh, technology continuation, technological continuation. But it is also a dollar and cents thing. And the problem is that most people yeah. stop thinking about dollars and cents when they go to buy the software or buy the solution. They don't think about the rest of it. So for a long time, Microsoft was giving away licenses to school districts in the United States. Mm -hmm. Oh, you bought some computers. Here's a free license. Well, the license was already built into the computer systems they were buying. You know, I mean, the vendor had already paid the Microsoft tax on that. So giving them a license was nothing. However, when it came time for the upgrade, Microsoft charged for that. And there was one school system in Oregon that had to pay $30,000 to upgrade their Microsoft licenses. That meant they had to fire three teachers. They didn't have the money in the budget to buy the licenses. You have to look ahead. You can't just look today. So now let me tell you the nightmare, okay? And this is a nightmare that I've been working on for some time to, to cure to the nightmare. nightmare. Um, we have this agency in the United States, you may have heard of them, they're called the NSA, the National Security Agency. They love to spy on people. They spy on so many people, even people in the United States. But hey, we're protected by our Constitution. We're protected by our Constitution. You guys are protected by nothing, okay? They love spying on you. And they don't even need permission to spy on you. For us, they need to go to our courts. We have to prove an issue and stuff. They need absolutely nothing to spy on you. So this is why they were spying on Dilma and reading your emails, which caused a big fervor for a little bit, but then everybody forgot about it. But the NSA didn't forget about it. And so, you know, how can they spy on people? Well, they use Microsoft software and they go, to, they maybe they go to a, maybe they go directly to Microsoft and Microsoft says, oh, yeah, sure, we'll make a special copy for you guys to use. And you can, you know, send it down to South America and you can spy on them with it. But maybe Microsoft pushes back and says, no, we're not going to do that because we don't want our Brazilian customers to be able to be spied upon. So the NSA goes to a court and gets a court order that forces Microsoft to make that change. Now, Microsoft could do one of two things. It can either say, okay, here's the change, or they can say, no, we're not going to do it, in which case they go to jail. There is no other alternative. It's either they make the patch or they go to jail. And of course, they're not going to tell you anything about this because they don't want this to get out. So that's, but see, that's on the software. And geez, what if Microsoft still says no? Well, the NSA could go to a compiler writer and say, gee, we'd like you to put a little trapdoor into the compiler writer, a Trojan horse into the compiler, that when it compiles a particular program on the Microsoft operating system, it actually generates code, which creates this trapdoor, and it's not going to show up in the source code for the operating system. Now, Microsoft thinks about these things and worries about these things. And they say to their customers, oh, you want to be able to look at our source code and see what we put in it to see what's in your operating system. So we're going to create this special place that you can go and you have to leave your cell phones outside, no recording gear, stuff like that. But you can go in there and you can use our systems to look at the source code that's being used to build your Microsoft operating system. Aren't we glorious? And everybody goes, oh, yeah. And you guys have one of these places in Brasilia. Oh, yes, you do. 
And you can go to Brasilia, and you, if you have a special dispensation from the Pope and God and Microsoft, you can go in and you can see the source code for somebody's version of Windows. But there's no guarantee that that's the source code for the version of Windows that actually built the binaries you have. There just is no guarantee, and there's no way you can prove sure. that it's there. So, you know, that's a big fallacy. Why, why Microsoft even bothers to do this is beyond me. Why anybody would bother to go to Brasilia, to go to this place, to waste their time looking at the hundreds of thousands of millions of lines of, of Windows NT because it's just useless. And it's, it's the, the same spectacle that happened with the voting machines as well. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> but in any case, all right, but say, let's say, let's say that Microsoft is tough. Let's say the compiler companies are tough. Neither one of them are going to give in to this pressure from this group called the NSA, except it's too bad because there are these people that create these things called BIOSes, right? It's not the operating system. It really comes from the hardware vendors that create these BIOSes. You could put the trap door in that, all right? But let's say the BIOSes are really good, and maybe they even distribute their, their code in source code form for the BIOSes and stuff. But you know, there's these companies that produce these CPU chips that have microcode in them. And that microcode is like tiny little programs. Sometimes it's not so tiny. Sometimes yeah. it's pretty huge. And these guys from the NSA could actually go to these companies and say, we want you to create a special chip for us. One that if it's in a certain state, it actually opens up a wormhole for us to, to move our patches in to make this thing no. And nobody's going to look at that. So and you say, oh, mad dog. That, Intel would never do that. <laughs> well, who says it's Intel that does it? Who says there's a fab that, you know, Intel owned fab that does it? Why can't it be somebody else's fab? Oh, Mad Dog, his fabs cost billions of dollars. Guess what? We have, we're working on stuff right now, it's trillion dollar budgets. And you could take a couple billion dollars and build a fab. And sure, you'll, you'll produce chips, and you can sell those chips to anybody that wants them, but you can produce a few chips that are just for you. Or just for Dilma. Okay? And so, this is why I helped to start this project called Caninas Lucas. Because we want to be able to build, design, and build a board, produce it in Brazil, from supply chains that are controlled by us in Brazil. And eventually we want to design computer chips in Brazil using an architecture called RISC-V. Mm -hmm. And RISC-V is such a simple in architecture with no microcode that you could actually look at the mask. You could prove that the mask was flawless you could then put it into your own fabrication plant, control the fabrication, and generate those chips to use in the systems you want to be really secure. So it's step by step, layer by layer, making things secure. And will you ever get to complete security? No. But you can certainly make it a hell of a lot harder for people to spy on you. You know, I get concerned about things like packets going outside of Brazil. I want to send a packet from Brasilia to Sao Paulo. I have no idea where that packet is going. It could well go to Ireland, where the NSA has this huge facility that they check every single packet, or at least the packets that they're interested in. 
And, you know, nobody really knows about this or cares about this or stuff. Well, some people do. Edward Snowden does. To, to that level of uh, completely justifiable uh, paranoia, uh, is it? I'm is not it paranoid. A, no, no, no. It, it is completely justifiable. It is. Uh, uh, but then wouldn't that mean that such a system would need to be fully, fully free software without even binary blobs, without firmware, oh, yeah. without proprietary firmware and so on? Oh, yeah. How far are we from that state? I don't know. Well, I mean, you can set up a Linux system today that has no binary blobs in it, okay? I mean, Richard Stallman has been using systems for quite some time that had only free software drivers in them, no binary blobs. He had a performance penalty because there were still some performance issues around some of the drivers and stuff like that. But over time, those might be overcome. Particularly, they could be overcome if people who bought those systems said to the hardware vendors, you're going to tell us how to tickle the little hardware registers inside your GPU. You're going to tickle, you know, you can tell us every single register and how to use it efficiently so that we can develop open source device drivers that are better than yours, okay? So when the Alpha Linux project was coming out, there was a math library. In, in every Linux system, there's a math library, libc, right? No, it's not it's just as it's, it's, uh, just a, it's libm, libm, yes. math library. Yes. And that's made up of, of subroutines like sine, cosine, tangent, whatever. Digital paid a mathematician a huge amount of money for the time to come up with a very optimized math library that was the fastest in the world, even on regular CPUs. But on the alpha, it was just blazingly fast. And digital was willing to give a binary object to the Alpha Linux project to ship, but they were unwilling to open up the source code for that math library because they said, if we do that, then Sun Microsystems or these other companies would be able to duplicate our work and we would lose our advantage. So there were these two groups. There was the free software people who were complaining to me that they couldn't get the source code. And then there were the digital product managers complaining to me that they were being beaten up about this. So I was being beaten up from both sides until finally I turned to the uh, free software people and said, you guys are such hotshot programmers. Why don't you come up with a better math library? There was silence in free software world. And three days later, I got this email message that came across and said, sign is now 1.5% faster. <laughs> a couple of days later, cosine is now 2% faster. Tangent is 0.5% faster. Cotangent is, and all the way down the subroutine line until eventually there was all but one subroutine that hadn't been made fast, that had been made faster. And that one subroutine, nobody got to work any faster, but it wasn't any slower either. And I said, why? Hasn't it gotten any faster? You guys did so well with all the rest of them. They said, well, you know, nobody uses that subroutine much. Nobody cares. So why are we going to spend time making it faster when it's fast enough because nobody uses it? And I can come up with hundreds of those examples. It's like a organic so, behavior. Yeah. There was, there was an X server one time that was developed by a good engineer at digital. And it was a dumb frame buffer uh, web server. It was or, uh, uh, X server. It was one that used no acceleration, no hardware acceleration. It just did bit blitz of bits into the frame buffer to put that up on the screen. And we had the fastest one in the industry because this engineer just hammered away at it. But he refused to le release the source code for it. 
And we were losing huge numbers of systems because nobody would buy this without getting the source code for our X server that ran on this dumb frame buffer soft hardware. So finally, I flew out to the West Coast from the East Coast, and I went into his office and says, okay, why don't you let us release the hard the software? And he goes, well, if we do, all these other companies are going to duplicate what we've done and we'll lose our performance advantage. I says, oh, what parts do you have you feel that are really good? He says, oh, look at this. We do this better than anybody, or at least as good as everybody, and better than some. I says, oh, so nobody else has that? Sun doesn't have that? Oh, yeah, they have it. Yeah. Oh, what about this one? We do this better. Nobody has that? Well, Hewlett Packard has that. And they release their source code, right? Oh, yeah, they do. So finally, <laughs> finally, he got down to one tiny little thing of using these triangles to do this stuff on the screen. I says, really? Nobody else has that? Nope, nobody else does that. Well, how often do you use that in general programming? Oh, hardly ever. So you're telling me that this thing that hardly nobody uses is preventing us from selling thousands of systems because we don't release our source code. And he thought there for a couple of seconds, he goes, okay, release the source code. You have to bring this down sometimes. You have to make people think about it. You know, it's not easy. <clears throat> Because there's lots of people out there who sell closed source software and they don't want you, they don't want to be forced into buying, into, into making the software free software. And they, they don't want you to use free software. They want you to use their software. Do you think that these same ideas about uh, developing software should also apply to developing hardware designs? Absolutely. And, and, and part of Canino's Lucos is figuring out a plan to allow people to have all of the information necessary to produce the hardware. But hardware and software are slightly different, okay? If I make a copy of a piece of software, I still have my copy. There is no, you know, there's, there's no real loss for me in giving somebody a free software. But when it's hardware, there are some physical hardware costs that are hard to get around. And, you know, we've gotten better at making the hardware available and cheaper and stuff like that, but it's still not quite there. And, you know, so what we're doing with Caninos Locos is we're forming two different groups where there's a the commercial group where people are interested in things like is this tested for vibration is this tested under different types of heat is this tested under different types of moisture how long are you going to guarantee this piece of, warrant this piece of hardware to exist to work how long are you going to support it with software all of that stuff goes into a commercial line of producing components that you can charge more for because they want to have that on the other hand, you have hardware that's produced for the maker, the maker lab students and stuff like that, where it's probably going to be operating in a temperature range of zero to 40 degrees Celsius or maybe 45 degrees Celsius, not 100 degrees Celsius or 150 degrees Celsius. Okay. And the, the amount of time that you're going to support it from a manufacturing standpoint is probably going to be three years or four years because after three or four years that student or that maker is going to go out and they want a faster better more capable processor they don't they don't need it to last for 30 or 40 years inside of an elevator or inside of an airplane or inside of a car yeah so if you divide it into those two camps you're going to be able to sell that a lot cheaper, but in larger quantities to certain ways of 
students and you know but the commercial side it costs more you know they'll pay more but they're see what they're buying is a service they're buying a combination of the hardware and the service and you let the commercial people help the students and the makers and stuff afford the hardware so we're dividing it into that and we will we will for both groups we'll be happy to show you the circuit diagram we'll be happy to give you the parts list we'll be happy to do all that type of stuff but are we going to you know are we going to give out the gerbers for instance you know what the gerbers are those are the yes. files that control the smt machine sure first of all the only reason you would want those gerbers is because you're going to put it on your SMT machine and you're going to try and manufacture it and you're going to try and get away with not having to do any additive engineering to it. And that's just not like free software. Right? Exactly. It's 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 like it's like distributing binaries, distributing Gerbers. The right. important thing is the schematics, right? The schematics, the layout. I mean, we're perfectly happy to show you the layout of the components and stuff mm -hmm. on the board, but the Gerbers, no. Okay. However, there are certain times where you can release the Gerbers. So let's say the board has been out there for, for a year or two years and stuff like that. You're in the process of making the next board, the next Gerber. You can release the Gerbers for the previous one. And you can even say, hey, you want to make this board? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Or you could release the board under a license, a license that says that they have to pay a certain amount per board to you for making it. But it's a lot less than the manufacturing cost. And that license helps you pay the people to continue making more boards. Now, if they take all the things you've given them and they design their own board, they'll have their own set of Gerbers. God bless. That's great. Go. But we would also like to say, hey, the ideas that you have make available to us so that we can put them into our board to make it to, to bring it out to other people. So hardware is slightly different, but I think you know there, there are these people that keep yelling, well, you have to give us everything, you have to give us Gerbers. I said, why do you need the Gerbers? Tell me why. And if I think you're right. You know, we may license it to you freely even. But don't just don't tell us that you and the other way you have of protecting yourself on this is with trademarks. Now, interestingly, trademarks are the only intellectual property that Richard that Richard Stallman smiles upon. He loves trademarks. So what's the difference between a Nike shoe and somebody else's shoe other than the little swoosh? Maybe nothing. But you pay a lot more for the Nike because it's got that swoosh on it because it's a Nike. Bob Young of Red Hat said, Linux is ketchup and we're going to make Heinz. So they could take free software, sent OS, the same the same software but having the trademarks pulled out but people paid more for red hat because it was red hat you know and so trademarks are very important and on every caninos lucos board that we produced we're going to have the little caninos lucos trademark and that means it's past inspection by anatel it's licensed to be used you know in brazil it's got a certain amount of warranty that goes with it, that if, if it breaks within a year or so, you send it back, we'll give you another one. If we can prove, if you can prove to us that it broke under normal usage, yeah, we'll warrant it for a year. And, you know, in the case of the commercial ones, we may warrant it for 10 years. But the trademark is your guarantee of goodness. That's what a trademark is. And uh, that's one way of protecting your intellectual property. 
So, well, may I may I ask you a personal question? Mm -hmm. Which GNU Linux distribution are you using now, and why? Well, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> And the reason for that is because everybody asks me that question. I always give them the same answer. I'm not going to tell you. Because most of the time when people ask me that question, they're really asking the question of what distribution should I be using? And the problem is I am not you. In fact, in a lot of ways, I'm not even me. I am a consultant. <laughs> I am a consultant. I use the distribution that my customers use. Because when I'm trying to figure out the problem that my customers are having, I want to make sure that I'm using the same distribution. So one day it could be Red Hat, another day it could be Debian, another day it could be Ubuntu, another day it could be. Okay. You know, so if I tell you what one I'm using, it may or may not be the best one for you. And I just tell people, hey, pull them down, try them out. There's all this stuff on the internet talking about what's the best distribution for people and stuff, you know. And then sooner or later you'll find out. <coughs> Pardon me. Are, are you using Windows XP, Mad Dog? <laughs> <coughs> I have never, ever used Windows. Uh, <coughs> take your time. Take your time. I did one time install windows xp for my parents they lived in a uh, <laughs> they lived in a retirement community and the people in their retirement group so used mean. microsoft um i lived 10 hours away i knew that i could not be their support person so i installed windows xp on their personal computer now, when I did this, Windows XP had just come out. It was on a 486 system. And um, it had an ISA bus. Now, if you're not familiar with the ISA bus, it was developed at a time where electronic components were very expensive. When In 1969, when I started into computers, a single transistor would cost a dollar fifty, and a power transistor would cost about three dollars and fifty cents. You could fill up the tank of your car with gasoline for three dollars and fifty cents. That was a single transistor. And so, to try and build a computer system out of transistors, discrete transistors, not integrated circuits, discrete transistors. That's why the PDP-8 would cost $50,000. They were all wire wrapped together or maybe soldered into breadboards and stuff like that. There was a lot of physical work that went into them. So, you know, us, I forget how we got, oh, my parents' computer system. So on an ISA bus, you plugged in a controller like a video card or audio controller or something like that. You started to install the operating system. The operating system probed the bus and the controller came back and said, I'm here. Oh, that's great, says the operating system. What are you? I'm here. No, 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 no. I know you're there, but what are you? I'm here. After a while, maybe you could uke out of it that it's a graphics <laughs> card. Okay, it's a graphics card. How much RAM DAC do you have? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's what's the resolution of the monitors attached to you? Oh, that was a good one. Because monitors were analog. They had no way of telling the board the frequency they ran at or how many lines they had or stuff like that. And so if you tried to drive them too fast, they could burst into flame. So you had to type in all this stuff about your equipment because there's no way that the CPU could ask about it. I'm here! Then along came the PCI bus with the Pentium and it probes. I'm here! Oh, and I'm a video card. I have this much RAM deck. I have this frequency and the monitor over there is this way. Okay. Everything overnight became a lot easier. Not, not because of the operating system, 
but because the hardware could say something reasonable. So here I am trying to install XP on my parents' computer with an OEM disk that has no device drivers with it. So I had to go out to every manufacturer's site, pull down the device driver, put it into the mix, go to find all the information I'm going to type into the XP system as is installing and bringing up these device drivers to get it to work. It took me. Now, remember, I had a master's degree in computer science. I'd worked on about 10 different operating systems by that point. I had been in the computer field for 11 years. It took me 12 hours to install that Microsoft XP operating system. So don't anybody ever tell me that it was so easy to install Microsoft as opposed to Linux because they never installed Microsoft. What they did was restore an image that somebody had put on there before they shipped the system to the store that they bought. And or just that... call, call your neighbor to help you out to it. This is no, no, right. no, 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 your neighbor had no more idea about how to fix it than you did, unless they were a Microsoft OEM and they lost all the hair from here to here <laughs> by doing the same stuff I was doing. No, no, these were system integrators that took the Microsoft disk and you know, OEM disk, put all the parts together got the system to build, created a backup file on the system and said, if your system ever craps out, reload this, you know, restore this. That's not installing that, okay? And when you want to add something new that wasn't in that little magical backup file, you had to install it with the same thing that I just told you about. You had to find a device driver that was maybe it came with the hardware in the little box, you know, with the instruction manual that told you what to type in, you know, or you went out to the website to pull it down and install it. And then you made another one of those little backup files because if you ever lost it again, you wanted to back up from that but you still had not installed Windows XP. I installed Windows XP 12 <laughs> freaking hours <laughs> with my parents looking over my shoulder saying, is it done yet? Is it done yet? <laughs> it's, so simple for, it's so simple for Sam to install it on his computer. You have I'm a dead. fucking master's degree on this. <laughs> I didn't say fucking. No, I <laughs> Get away from that word. <laughs> no, not only not only did I have a master's degree, I had taught operating system design. I had taught systems administration. I had taught compiler theory three or four times by the time I had to install this stinking crappy XP system on a on a on a personal computer. Eu vou pedir ao, ao ao Thiago que me ajude, ao, ao Kobe, né, que me ajude aqui um pouquinho, porque nós estamos chegando perto do final, e eu queria que você dissesse isso para ele, que a gente está adorando a conversa, e ainda tem umas duas perguntas aqui, uma é do Simplex e outra é do Angélico, que está aqui no nosso chat, se você puder fazer para ele, falar isso tudo e ainda, fazer a pergunta do Angélico, eu agradeço. Okay. I have a follow-up question to the, no, no, pre the previous okay. thing we were talking about. All right, I'll give you a second to talk about that. I have a, one more thing to add to the XP mm -hmm. thing, right? Okay. <laughs> so remember the early days of Linux, right? What were systems? Why did Linus Torvalds get the idea to write Linux in the first place? It's because he had just gotten a brand new 386 system with an ISO bus for Christmas. And he knew that the operating system that came with it, which was MS-DOS and Windows 3.1, didn't take advantage of all the things in the 386 system had. Now, what did the 386 system have that 
the 286 system did not. What was it? Please, please tell us. <laughs> was it, was Demand it the... page virtual memory. Up until that point, the concept of virtual memory or having more virtual memory than you had real memory was done with swapping where you had to break up your program and push parts of it out onto the disk and you brought in parts of it when you needed it and stuff but it was incredibly poor compared to demand page virtual memory which the ibm which the intel 386 processor supported and so Linus is, and, and Microsoft, of course, was not going to change their operating system to take advantage of that because there's only a certain number of 386s out there. So they didn't bother, you know, changing their operating system to one to support demand page virtual memory until there were millions of them. So Linus was stuck here with this 386 that he knew was a better chip than the 286 and the 186 and the 8086 that Microsoft was still supporting. And he said, oh, my God, you know, I need a real I need a real kernel when like Unix supports, you know, like Berkeley Unix or almost anybody's Unix at that point supports. And that's what fired him up to build that kernel to support demand page virtual memory. Now, I said all of this, but remember, by this time, the Pentiums were starting to come out. And the PCI bus and stuff like that. People were moving towards Pentiums, okay? So they put Linux on their old computers, the ones they had around for a while, which were all 386s, 486s that had the ISA bus. And so new in new Microsoft systems going into Pentiums could go in and install relatively nicely, but Linux going on to ISA based systems and stuff like that was still typing in all this crappy data. I wrote Linux for dummies. Okay. Uh, there was version one, edition one. I wrote completely edition two. One third of the book was telling Windows users how to find out about the hardware in their system so they could type it in to Linux installing on the 3D6 and 4D6 systems. One third of the book. Today, I would make that two pages. Here's how you install Linux. Boop. Bring up the graphics. Boop, 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 boop. Done. Mm -hmm. The rest of the book could be done something useful. Okay. Now, ask your question. You probably forgot sure. about now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, we were discussing, uh, we were talking about uh, the sharing of schematics. Mm -hmm. And you used uh, Labrador as an example. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have this question for at least a couple years we've been asking this, and we haven't yet got a good answer, mm -hmm. uh, which is where are the schematics for Labrador? And what is the timeline plan for actually releasing schematics? Because the documentation in the website and the institutional video and several materials about Labrador mention that it is a system that is fully free, both hardware and software. And then I, I, I would say that being free software is mandatory in my opinion, but being like a, a free design, a, a public design of hardware is not so critical, even though it's nice. So if it is not actually, then, it, in my opinion, it would, it would be okay to not release the schematics if you don't want to. Uh, as long as you reveal the documentation and the website to not say so. Uh, otherwise, if you really are willing to do so, uh, so I, I, we, we, we would just want to know when, because it's been two years. <coughs> been asking. And okay. I'm, not, I'm not talking about Gerbers. I'm just talking right. about schematics. Okay. Yeah. How many Labradors have you purchased? I haven't yet. but Okay. Okay. You haven't purchased any. No. Nobody nobody has purchased any. We haven't gotten out beyond seed level at this point. Okay. Now, if you sign up as a developer's program and we actually get one, 
then we can make a decision about whether we want to free up all this stuff. But what's happening is that a lot of this stuff is still changing. And we have never gotten into actually the selling of Labradors to get them out Let's the door. See. So the, the idea is to develop it closed doors and only publish it afterwards? No. If you join the developers program, then you get access to a certain amount of stuff. But for example, we've developed about three or four different IO boards at this point. And we, we want to make sure that the IO boards that we're putting out there are act in quantity are actually IO boards that we want to support for a while. And what's happening is a lot of the hardware components are going out of stock. I mean, so the first Labradors we produced had USB 3.0, uh, one USB 3.0 port and two USB two ports. Today, if I was going to release it, I would want to release something that had all USB 3 or maybe USB 3.2, you know, because USB 3.0, I really don't care about anymore. And, and from my viewpoint, people should be looking at USB 4.0 as being the place to actually move systems of the future. The original Labrador was Bluetooth. Uh, I think it was 4.1, may even have been earlier. And so we've been developing these, but we haven't been selling them. Now, the good news is we're getting very close to doing that. One of the reasons we haven't been selling them is for a variety of political reasons where the University of Sao Paulo and USP could not uh, sell stuff. They could sell services. We could sell the service of designing something, but we couldn't sell an actual board. And we couldn't afford to keep producing boards and stuff like that unless we could sell them for at least enough money to pay for the parts to allow us to make more boards. So we finally have gotten through all the political and bureaucratic bullshit to do this. And now in the next couple months, hopefully, we're going to actually be selling the boards. And that's the point that we will go through and start releasing the circuit diagrams, the parts lists, and stuff like that to the general public so that we'll meet our, meet our need of openness. In fact, mm -hmm. Professor Zufo is, was been, has been after me for the last couple of weeks to come up with a specific plan on that. And that's where I started off today, talking about commercial boards where you're building these under license. A lot of these people really don't even care about having the Gerbers and stuff like that. You're making a fixed number of boards for them that have special properties. And all they want is the boards and you'll be able to make these. Other people might want to have a Gerbers, but you have a separate set of Gerbers. It might be the same set of Gerbers. It's interesting. Think about MySQL. Remember MySQL? It was yeah. the same code, but they licensed it out both with the GPL and with a different license. In fact, many licenses. Because they owned the copyright, they could license it any way they wanted to. So they licensed it with GPL. You could take their source code. You could build MySQL and everything like that. You could change it. But because it was under the GPL, you had to give away, you had to give away your changes. You had to make them at least available to other people. But there were some people that said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to give away my source code. Oh, well, if you don't want to give away your source code, you come back to MySQL and they'll license it a different way. And then you don't have to give away your source code, but you're going to pay for that ability okay so was my sql free software absolutely absolutely but did free did my sql also have a different business plan that allowed them to sell non-free software yes they did and they did and sun microsystems thought that that was such a great plan that they bought my sql and then the MySQL people said, hey, we're going to fork this. We're going to go, go MariaDB. And, and then Oracle bought, bought Sun. So 
you know, all I'm saying is that we are still, everything on the website is correct, but we haven't sold any of those and we don't want to could do create, create a lot of confusion in the marketplace by saying this is a Labrador of this design until we're ready to. But if you sign up for a developer's program, we look at what you're doing and say, okay, here is this. And you have to understand all these other things that we're about to tell you. Parts of parts of what we're doing is we have arrangements, and, and, and this is true of a lot of hardware manufacturers. We have arrangements with certain hardware manufacturers where we're not allowed to release certain pieces of information. We're working to get around that. We're working to make it so that we can release everything. All the different programming data sheets and stuff like that that goes along with it. But it takes time. It's mm -hmm. not overnight. Mm -hmm. I know one hardware manufacturer that didn't want to open up the software for his device driver because he was ashamed of the comments that his developers had put into it. <laughs> where his developers were talking about all the suppliers of the components that went into their device, their controller. And in talking about them, they were putting all sorts of shit comments into their source code. And when we found out that that was the reason they didn't want to open it up was we said, hey, we'll go through it. We'll help you clean up all that stuff. And they said, okay, then we'll open it up. But that was it. It was a Japanese firm, and they did not want to lose the face to their suppliers that they would have lost if their suppliers had seen those comments. Huh. So let that be a lesson to you. When you write comments, use the mad dog philosophy. You may hate the people supplying you this stuff, but don't put it in your source code. <laughs> <laughs> But well, sooner or later, sooner or later, it's going to come back and bite you. Such great advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's particularly true for open source projects, right? Because I tell students, if you work on an open source project, and you, now you're coming along towards graduation, you know, and you want to have something to show to a prospective employer. If you're working for Microsoft, you get to show them nothing. Microsoft doesn't even put your name into their software, right? You're, you know, they, you, you can't see the mailing list. You can't see the discussions. You can't see the code. You can't see anything. You only have your word you work for them. But in open source, you can see all that stuff. You can see the mailing list. You can see the code that's written. You can see the conversations and stuff in a good open source project. You can see all that stuff if you want to. So Mark Shuttleworth, when he was starting up Ubuntu, decided to take all the Debian mailing lists and all the Debian source code and put it on his laptop computer down to Antarctica for nine months. He sat there and he went through all the source code. He went through all the mailing lists and stuff. And when he came back, he said, I want you and you and you to come work with me on Ubuntu. He didn't have to call any HR people, didn't have to have any resumes sent to him. That's how he developed his first programming staff. When I was coming out of Drexel, yeah, I had my diploma, I had taken these courses, but the thing that got me my first job was this portfolio of programs that I had written in both Fortran and PDP-8 assembly language and so forth. And I had interviewed, I had sent out uh, 300 resumes. I had a hundred contacts to say, I had about 50 interviews and then I had three offers out of that. But the reason I had my job at Aetna was they said, oh, you programmed in assembly language. How did you learn that? I read this book and I practiced. <laughs> you learned assembly language by reading the book and practicing? Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you program IBM assembly language? I don't know. Do you have a book? <laughs> and they said, okay, we're going to hire you. 
I had I had to go up there for a second interview up there that took a couple of weeks to go up there. But by that time, I'd gone to the bookstore and I bought a book called Programming the IBM 360 370 in Assembly Language. <laughs> yeah, it's not the same. It's, it's not almost, the same. Yeah. It's not the same. <laughs> But I, I got that book. I started reading it and says, OK, it's more complicated. It has more registers and it has different addressing modes and different data types of stuff. But yeah, I could do this. And that's what I did. And for, for seven years, I programmed only in assembly language. I never programmed in COBOL. I never programmed in Fortran. I only programmed in assembly language at Aetna. And in fact, during the first three years, I never actually generated any new programs. My job was to take other people's programs and make them work faster. To find out what were the bottlenecks of their programs and then tweak their code to make it run faster. And there was one time I took a job that ran in 15 hours in, in batch at night and I made it run in five hours. I took another program. <laughs> this was really bad. <laughs> there was this programmer at Aetna, supposedly a senior programmer in our group, who had written this program that when he ran the program, not only did his program run slow, but every other program running on the IBM mainframe slowed down. And every program on any one of the other computers that were even associated with that computer slowed down. And my boss asked me to look at this. He said, don't talk to the programmer that wrote it because he's one of our senior programmers and we don't want to insult him that you're a fresh out of university student who's going to be looking at his program. But we want you to look at his program and figure out what's going on. So I started looking at the program and part of it was written in COBOL, part was written in Fortran, part was written in PL1, part of it was actually written in APL, and part of it was written in assembly language. So I took this monstrosity of a program because in the 4,000 people we had in data processing at Aetna, this guy and I were probably the only two people that knew all of those languages. And I profiled it and I found out that there was one machine language instruction that was taking 99% of the wall clock time. One. So when you profiled it, there was this huge spike that went up on this one instruction and then everything else was more or less flat. I said, what does that instruction do? What is that instruction? That instruction was read the clock. Now, that sounds simple enough, right? Read the clock, go into register, pull out the time. It's a big number. Then break it up into days and weeks and stuff like that to get the time of day. Why would it take so long? Well, you see, read the clock was what the IBM system used to synchronize all the threads in the system, all the <laughs> CPUs. If you're doing SMP, if you're doing locking and unlocking of the locks inside the kernel, read the clock was the way you got this unique number of all the CPUs so that you could do whatever you had to do in that critical section of code. And what did read the clock do? Read the clock told the operating system to stop all the IO that's going on in everything in every system to flush all the buffers to get all the buffers flushed to quiesce every single other part of the CPU so that one CPU, one thread could say, read the clock and get that unique number. And then everything started up again, okay? All the threads started up again. The buffers started to fill again. The IO started to go again. Then read the clock. And this guy was reading the clock for 100,000 records every night. <laughs> <laughs> on this one computer to cause everything else to slow down. So I went about this... clock, I, I can no, 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 hear. No, 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 no,
All right, but let me, uh, I'll just finish this a little bit more. Okay. So I finally went to this guy. His name was Richard. I said, Richard, why are you reading the clock? He says, oh, he was Scottish. He says, oh, I got to read the clock because I have to find out what day it is. You're reading the clock a hundred thousand times doing your program to find out what day it is. Couldn't you just read the clock one time at the beginning of your program and store it in a variable and not have to read the clock again? Oh, yeah, I could probably do that, couldn't I? And so he changed the program. And then instead of taking like 15 hours to run at night, it took three minutes. The operators downstairs started the program up and it finished so fast they thought it had crashed. <laughs> they couldn't believe it and he, 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 you know and so the next day i told my boss what had happened and why this has happened and the other thing i asked richard is richard why did you write this program in so many different languages because richard only you and i in all of etna actually know all of these languages oh well, I'm taking this course in language design. And every two weeks, we have another language. So in order to become familiar with that language, I wrote the next part of the program in that language. <laughs> I said, Richard, you either have guaranteed that you have a job for life maintaining that program, or you're going to have your ass fired in three days. And sure enough, in three days, his ass was fired. <laughs> so that was before I started using my name, Mad Dog, to remind myself not to lose my temper. Let's hope Richard is not watching this video. Probably Richard is dead by this point. Oh, yeah. He probably had some other boss kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Ai, ai, genial, cara, adorei. So, that's because uh, uh, talking about clock, yeah, I, I, I can hear some sounds, clock sounds behind you. Oh, yes, Cuckoo. I collect mechanical clocks. Yeah, I have about 60 of them to uh, 60. Yeah, when they start taking lights and switches off of computers. I started to become really nervous about it because I could no longer see what was happening inside the computers. I had to take everything by faith. So I started collecting and repairing mechanical clocks. I took a course in how to repair mechanical clocks because you can look at the clock and you can see at one time everything moving, you know, exactly how it works. And that gave me a good deal of satisfaction in doing that. Yeah. But another time I had a program, this was at Hartford State Technical College, and it was a program that was written by one of the former students there. And that program took 10 and a half hours on a PDP 1170 computer to sort 1,206 32 byte records. 10 and a half hours on a machine that ran about the speed of a VAX 11780, about a million instructions a second. And when it ran, everything else in the school stopped because the guy who wrote it was running this at high priority. And, you know, it was upsetting the students. It was upsetting the rest of the administration. I was not allowed to do programming for the administration because I was a teacher. This was against the union. And, um, but I took one of my students aside and said, you're a good student, you're, you're good at programming in basic. I'm about to teach you stuff that you wouldn't be learning for another year or so. I'm going to teach you recursive reentrant programming. And I'm going to teach you what a sort merge is, a sort is and stuff, and we're going to rewrite this program. So I told him how to write it. And he wrote it, and it went from 10 and a half hours to three minutes on the same machine. 
because I took all the data, separated the segments, brought the segments into memory at one time, sweared at memory, and then burst it all together again. And again, when the when the guy who wrote it came in the next day and typed in the name of his pro <laughs> program to run and expected it was going to take 10 and a half hours and it was done in three minutes. He was uh, the student. When he when he, he had written a part of the program, just a portion of it, and he ran it and he came back like that and said, ready. He goes, it didn't work. <laughs> I says, what do you mean it didn't work? He says, well, it came back so fast. I says, let me see the code. I looked at the code. He says, yeah, it worked. And he just couldn't believe how fast the computer was. And it is. And most people think that computers are slow because they're not programming them right. They don't use cache properly. They don't think about the, the locality of the data, the locality of time. You know, they're too busy using some type of damn framework where nobody teaches the underlying shit to it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's another reason why we're doing Caninos Locos is to, it's, it's one reason why the Raspberry Pi was started up. Because kids were coming out of high schools knowing less about computers than they did 20 years before. They would get these computers that say, don't open up the computer, it voids your warranty. We're not going to show you how the software works. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to show you how the operating system works. So how do you write really interesting code if you don't understand that efficient code? So it's beginning to get a little late. That's why I was worried about when you said clocks that you were <laughs> trying to hint to me. And I have, and since... So first of all, Alvaro, you have to show him your shirt. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Very good. And I have one story to tell about him. So I first got to How know him. How much do you understand Portuguese? Uh, because no one's translate the Turica's. He knows. He knows Portuguese. He, he's just shy. Uh, no, I know, I know Google Translate. And since he showed me his shirt earlier today, <laughs> Google Translate. I know, I know, I know all the important words in, in, in Portuguese, you know, cerveja, cachaça, caprina, you know, all the, all the important words. Okay. Bonjia, you know, all those, <laughs> you know, so in any case, I forget exactly how we first got together but it was in it was rio de janeiro and he had this um he had this little group of people he got together to program i can tell you he... the story okay you can go ahead and tell the story <laughs> yeah uh i've i've organized in the university a an event called arduino hack and beer and you sent me a direct message on twitter saying uh, you'd like to join us next time you in Brazil because there's a problem or something in the US uh, like that restricts beer in universities and things like this. And then we organized when you were in Niterói, uh, Rio and Niterói, and we met. Yep. And so he had these group of, you know, he would send out a message and say, we're going to have another hack and beer. It's going to be on this date, this time. What do you want to work on? And people come back and say, oh, we'd like to have all these things working, all these things. He put them all together. He'd say, okay, we had all these ideas. Let's take top five or six of these ideas. We'll put them out. And you form groups around these five or six ideas. And we'll meet and have hack and beer. And you bring some money and... You know, I'll supply chips and stuff like that in the beer, and you pay me the money for that. You get all the components you need for this stuff, and you can work on these projects. So he assigns me to this project. I don't know anything about the Arduino. Oh, you know, a little bit. I know what it is and stuff like that. But he assigns me this project to these people are trying to make a transducer to measure the sound, use it like sonar to figure out how far away things are. And they bought one of these little transducer units and they were using that and they had some code from another project 
that would get used transducer and they're trying to make it work and i'm going okay well where's the data sheet for this particular part and they go data sheet what's that the data sheet is tell you tells you what to program it oh okay so we went onto the we went on the internet we we amazingly found the data sheet for this part and i'm showing it to him i says well you know something this part data sheet doesn't match up with the circuit diagram you have doesn't match up with the software you have because the part that the data sheet and or the part the the circuit and the and the and the software is talking about has a buffer in it it sends out the pulse it comes back it's the hardware that figures out how much time it took for that to happen and then the software just reads that buffer your part doesn't have the buffer and so it would have to be the software that would send out the pulse and then sit there and loop and stuff until the the, the comes back and i don't think the arduino is up to that <laughs> <laughs> so they never got their program to work but that was okay because they learned so much along the way of what the data sheet was how to find it you know the difference between the hardware and stuff and that also explained why their part was so cheap and the other part was so because they found the other part on the net but it was much more expensive well it was expensive because it had the extra hardware with it to be this buffer so that was that was we had a great time at hacking hack and beer and i said to alvaro i said have you ever thought about doing this full time as a real job and he looked at me and said no i haven't i says i think you should i think that there would be other people who might want to pay for this that they want to learn how to use the arduino they want to you know have somebody there that could help them and stuff and you could put together classes to teach and advertise them and stuff and so he did and for what was it, a couple of years you went around basically doing that and yeah, also, it was since 2010, 12, and for like five years, I think. And of course, you also did consulting for the people that tried to make the Arduino do what they needed to and said, oh, man, this is really hard. And so you would do consulting and help them with those projects, right? Yeah. So about that same time, he tells me, hey, I really hate having a beard. I'm going to go and I'm going to have laser surgery done to kill all the follicles so I can't have a beard. And I said, really? I think you'd look really good with a beard. He says, yeah, but none of the women like beards. They really don't, you know? I says, really? I think you know a different style of woman than I know. I said, I think you maybe should grow a beard and see what happens. So a couple months go past. And he, somehow I see a picture of him with a beard. Says, Do the women like a beard? He goes, oh, yeah, they like a beard. <laughs> <laughs> it was like 80 years ago. <laughs> well, I haven't shaved since 1969, so you still have a few more years to go before. Uh... Okay. 69. So 1969. Since, since Unix was born. Since Unix was born, wow! Since, <laughs> since Linus Torvalds was born, he was born in 1969. It was like before the Unix epoch. Yes, yeah, the Unix <laughs> epoch actually started 17, after, yeah. right? Yeah, right. <laughs> wow! <laughs> because and before that, they didn't think the Unix would be around long enough to to reach even the first year of the epoch. So, you know, it was a it was a fun project. It wasn't anything serious. <laughs> And everybody here who's got the camera on likes to have a beer. Yeah, but you have to be careful about that because, <laughs> I mean, for a long time, there were people going around saying, well, you have to have a beer to be a, a Unix systems administrator. We had all these women who were great systems administrators, but they didn't have a beard. And, you know, Livia I, doesn't have. I didn't want them to feel <laughs> left out, right? So, you know, and there, there were some people who were great systems administrators and, male who didn't have a beard either and that's fine but the idea of him killing off his follicles so he could never grow a beard was uh, i didn't think that was a good idea 
I think, you know, and so I, I just think he was just running with the wrong group of women. <laughs> in, in general, I think that uh, shaving my beard takes too much time. So I just prefer not to waste my time. Not only that, but you're <laughs> shaving it early in the morning when you're not even awake. You're not fully awake and you're putting this you. really sharp it's thing. Really, this it's sharp really thing. dangerous. Come on. Your yeah. neck. You're going to bleed. <laughs> you know? And think about the money you've saved. The time and the money you've saved by not shaving. Well, I don't, I don't use electric. I don't use electric. Well, some people, yeah. Very, very dangerous. Dangerous. Yeah. So I, you know, and you know, I think you should. I think you should talk to my wife a little bit about this because she uh, is really annoyed uh, <laughs> by my beard, and uh, every time I, I I grow my beard, she uh, complains and tells me, "Oh, come on! I want you to be uh, your skin to be smooth and something like that." And I, I think that you should convince her that it's a good idea to grow a beard like yours. So I had two friends and one of them was going in to get married and his wife had convinced him because he had all had this really long black hair, really long black beard. You no, know, he was about 23, 24. She had never seen him without his beard and long hair, but for their wedding, she convinced him to get his hair cut short and shave his beard. So he did that. And she looked at him and said, I really don't like you like that. <laughs> well, it was too late. <laughs> they had to go to the wedding. They had the, the, this big wedding picture taken, framed, and put up over the fireplace. A couple of years later, they'd had some children, you know, and one of the little girls who's about three or four years old looks up at this guy who's standing right beside her mother and says, Who is that man? Because by that time, he'd grown his hair back and his beard back, and she couldn't tell that this guy who was clean-shaven with short hair up in the picture was the same guy as her father. And she was all upset because there was a strange man with this woman, with their mother up in this picture. <clears throat> so they had to take the picture down and hide it until she was old <laughs> enough to realize that one and the same. So that's the first story. The second story, another friend, really long hair, big beard. They take him in, convince him to cut off his hair, cut his hair and his beard for the wedding. You go to the barber shop. Everybody's around because this is the first time they've ever seen him, you know, in their memory, without his hair and beard. So as a as a as a lark, they said to the barber, cut half of his face, cut shave it and cut the hair on half and leave the other half long and with the beard. The barber did that. And once again, the, the, the bride looks at him and goes, I don't like you clean shaven. And he looks at him and says, it's too late. I can't have, you know, I can't go to the, to the wedding half, half and half, like some type of freak. So <laughs> he cut the rest of it off. And just as soon as they could, you know, he grew it back again. So I, I really I really can't understand it because, you know, I, I think one thing is your beard is really short. It's going to be scratchy like that. You need to grow it longer so it's fluffier and softer, you know, and use some nice, you know, uh, conditioner on it to to make it nice and soft for your for your wife. OK, I'll but, share uh, that. <laughs> yeah. É, alguém, okay. mais, alguém mais quer fazer alguma pergunta? Ou já podemos encaminhar, que já estamos aí para duas horas e meia de live. Eu pedi ao Kobe que yeah. fizesse essa tradução aí para pro, pro, pro o Mad Dog. Mas eu vocês... não tinha mais duas na lista I que wanna, você falou? Não. Ah, ok, tá bom. Eu acho que é isso. O que sobre o seu shirt, Mad Dog? Oh, ah, essa é yeah, boa this, this shirt, this shirt is in honor of Pride Month and the riots which were held at the Stonewall Inn in 1969. It was the first time that uh, LGBTQ people stood up against the police that were harassing them in New York City. There was a bar there called the Stonewall Inn 
and gay people would go there to have a drink and to dance and things like that. And the police would show up every once in a while, put them into a paddy wagon, take them downtown, book them and everything. It was embarrassing. A lot of these people were still in the closet to their family or their, you know, their workers and stuff. And one night the police showed up and started to harass them. And there were these very large dykes. Now, a dyke is a man who dresses up like a woman, complete with purse and beads and everything, wigs and everything. But these are some of the largest women you've ever seen. These are really big guys dressed up like women. And they decided they didn't like being harassed by the police. They started taking their pocketbooks and slamming them and hitting them. And it surprised the police so much that they all ran into the bar and barricaded the door and couldn't get out because all these gay people were rioting in the streets. And uh, the riots kept on for the next couple of days. The police finally got some backup help, but the riots kept on. And that was the start of the LGBTQ movement in New York City and, and throughout the United States. Uh, so that the next year, there was a parade, a pride parade in honor of this riot. And so every year after that, there was a pride parade in June. And I believe, I can't remember, I think it's June the 28th is the actual anniversary of the Stonewall in riots. And today, there's actually a little park there the Stonewall Inn is a national monument. It was made a national monument by Barack Obama. There's a little statue outside of, of gay and lesbian people and stuff talking and everything. And um, so that's that's what Pride Month is. And so my, my, my shirt says, the first Pride was a riot, you know, which has a dual meaning, of course. It was a riot, <laughs> but it was also a lot of fun with beating up the police and letting them have their own medicine. So that's what my shirt is about. And this month All I will right. be wearing a whole bunch of different pride shirts of different types. So, But I like, I like, and I like it has a special shape because uh, we can see our tattoo. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was another reason, you know, the talks on that side. Yeah. I was about to ask you to show us this. Oh yeah. Well, I, I, I also have to lift my leg up to show you my, well, maybe I can just take my camera, show you my latest tattoo. Well, let me see, I should be able to do this. Oops. Okay, where, there it is. Oh, you dress it. <laughs> <laughs> Tux the pirate, he has a, he has a skull uh, stein for drinking beer out of. Yeah. He has a he has a uh, cutlass in one flipper. He has a gold tooth. And when the artist was drawing was drawing the picture, I said, you know, penguins don't have teeth. And the artist kind of looked at me strange and said, this one does. <laughs> so he, has a, he has a gold tooth and a peg leg. And he's standing in front of a, a beer barrel. Now, the first tattoo, this talks, I got him in Buenos Aires. And the reason I got it in Buenos Aires is I had this friend of mine, Daniel Coletti, really great guy. And I went down there. He was in charge of the Linux users group down there in Buenos Aires for a long time. I went down to one of their meetings and Daniel says, well, you know, you can stay in my house. You don't have to go to a hotel. And that was okay with me. Daniel's a great guy. So I go to his house and there's his wife and his kids and stuff. And Daniel comes out into the kitchen. This is the first time I've ever seen Daniel without a shirt. And he has a tux tattoo. And I go, Daniel, you have a tux tattoo. He says, you never told me. He goes, well, it's kind of private. I don't like, you know, don't make a big thing about it, you know. So I go home and for two years, all I can think about is tux tattoo. Tux tattoo. <laughs> so I go back to Buenos Aires. He says, Daniel, I'm coming back to Buenos Aires. You have to take me to your tattoo artist and I have to get a tux tattoo. Okay. But by that time, his tattoo artist has traveled on, so he takes me to a different one. And on Tux, on, on, on the Tux tattoo, normally you see Tux, he's looking off to the left. Well, in this one, I got him so he's looking to the right. But when I look in a mirror, he's looking to the left. <laughs> so 
know, when you see him, he's looking. So he's not the same as Daniel's, but he's almost the same. And I get it, and I'm really happy with it. But then I think to myself, I'm in trouble. Because what <laughs> happens if Richard Stallman sees this, and I don't have a canoe? <laughs> So a couple of years go past, I go back to Buenos Aires. Daniel, I need a GNU. Okay, tattoo artist moved on. New tattoo artist. Okay, you know, get that. So then I decide I want to have a really good tattoo down on my calf. So that when I put on shorts, people can see it. But I put on long pants, they can't see it. And I get my friend to design this. He's the same guy who did some of the original Tux uh covers of the linux journal way back at the beginning of the linux journal oh. he draws it and i'm about to get it put on my leg i want to do this in brazil or buenos aires because it's a lot cheaper in brazil or buenos aires and i start to do it and then i have a heart attack and actually i have two heart attacks and they put me on blood thinner medicine and if there's one thing you don't want to do when blood thinner medicine is have somebody sticking needles in you thousands of times every minute while you're in blood thinner, you know. So, and I went to my heart doctor and said, you know, I really want to have this tattoo done. He says, oh, where are you going to have it done? I says, in, in, in Brazil. He goes, in Brazil? Oh, my God. Are they going to be sanitary? I says, this is Brazil. It's not some like fucking third world nation like Bangladesh or something like that, right? We are cleaner than USA. <laughs> oh. so, so, but in any case, I can't do it for three years. For three years, I'm on this blood thinner medicine. And finally, the doctor says, okay, I'm taking you off of the blood thinner medicine. You have to wait six months for it to get out of your system. And then you can have your tattoo. So six months to the day, I go down. I see my friend of mine, Daniel Daniel um, Galvon in Curitiba, because he's got really nice tattoos. All of his, he's got three brothers. All of them are really nicely tattooed. And you know, I says you have to take me. So he takes me to this great tattoo artist, and I have the whole tattoo done. And uh, it was in time for DepConf of 2019 i actually was able to show it there i had it done that time and uh, by the time the deb conf rolled around it was like a week later and i could undo the bandaging and stuff and show it to people did you know that uh, the, the gnu that you have in your tattoo was drawn by a brazilian friend of ours uh, aurelio heckert no i didn't know that yes it's, it's, and, it's... and it's it's the artwork artwork that the gnu project uses the official logo was done by him uh, because before there was one that was hand drawn, uh, but then afterwards they, uh, he made a vector, uh, an, an SVG, the very bold black black on white uh, uh, artwork that you have. Aurelio there's, Heckert. There's one more. There's one more tattoo I'd really like to get. That would be on my left leg, and that one is of Tux as a wizard. And uh, this this drawing was actually drawn for me because there was this T-shirt company that was going to make T-shirts for different Linux developers and stuff. And they made one for Linus and they made one for Alan Cox and they made a T-shirt for me. But they didn't sell that many of the T-shirts. And I don't think they even I don't think they ever sold my T-shirt. They just drew the drawing and showed it to me. So when they decided they weren't going to make they weren't going to make any more T-shirts, I said, "Well, could I have the artwork? Could you transfer the copyright to me?" And they said, "Fine." So I have this copyright, and I want to have it redrawn into a vector drawing, and then put it on my my left leg. So on my right leg will be pirate tux, and my left leg will be wizard tux. Well, I'm so sorry for interrupting you because we could carry this conversation for. Forever. Six, seven hours. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, our transmission is about to, to be cut at any moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm so honored. And in the name of our community, um, I'd like to thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with us. Uh, of course, you, you can uh, continue talking to us after the transmission, if you like, of course. Uh, 
but it's it was a very very big honor having you here uh and i can say this uh maybe for everybody that is in this room sure well it was very nice talking to you guys very nice and and lady very nice (laughs) talking to you and um Maybe we can do this uh, again some other time because I mean, oh, yes. a little bit. please, Great. please, please do that. <laughs> so, I am looking forward to hopefully getting down to Latino wear in November or so. I'm hoping that by November there'll be enough people vaccinated yeah. in different countries to be able to make it safe for people to go to Latino wear in person. And if that was the case, I would love to go down there for that and uh, and do something in person again. You know, virtual is nice, but to me, to to touch people, to, you know, shake their hands and stuff like that and um, to show them stuff. Hopefully by that time, uh, Canidas Locos will be in full swing of manufacturing and selling these units and people can do that. We have plans of creating educational programs based around Canidas uh, locos um, teaching people how to put together solutions for customers so that they can sell these solutions and put the money, put the profits into their pocket instead of it going into the pockets of Oracle or NCR or Microsoft or people like that. And because it'll be done with open source or free software, they'll be able to change it to meet their customers' needs instead of being forced to only give them what these companies allow them to give. So stay tuned. That will become visible sure, very soon. Sure. Yeah. And maybe when that happens, I can come back on and, and talk to you about those programs, and those projects. Great. All right. Well, happy hacking. Kretil, okay. você quer falar rapidinho alguma Take coisa, Kretil? Uh, just thank you very much. Eu que agradeço and a você we, também. We, né? we will we'll be again another time. I'm sure. I'm sure your company. Too. So if you want, if you, do you, did you enjoy like us? Oh yeah. Talk? Yeah. Oh okay. So you'll be repeat soon. Okay. <laughs> Take it easy, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. É, e é você que está assistindo aqui até agora, o Mad Gog saiu correndo aqui. <risos> você que ficou acompanhando essas quase três horas de papo, fantástico. O Mad Gog realmente é uma figura é, sensacional, tem histórias para contar que não acabam mais. Né? E a gente aprendeu Sim. muita coisa aqui hoje. O, 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 o Juca está que nem pinto no lixo, né? está assim no ambiente dele, é o hard, é, é o hacking. Ele está adorando, né? <risos> Obrigado, Turicas, eu nunca tinha falado com você. Obrigado por aparecer aqui pela primeira vez. Obrigado pelo apoio, o, o Nada, eu Obi. E, e também o, ao, ao Aloysio, que é o Luiz se vacinou hoje. No, final, no comecinho da live, ele começou a manifestar alguns sintomas desagradáveis. Então, ele teve que sair para dar uma, dar uma relaxada. Lívia, muito obrigado pelo apoio que você deu aqui também. Né? Simplex não foi dessa vez, mas a gente, a gente guarda aí que parece que ele vai voltar mesmo, então a gente conversa mais uma vez. Eu sei que adorei essa conversa de hoje, fiquei muito feliz também com a participação de vocês, o pessoal que assistiu lá pelo Odyssey e o pessoal que está aí conversando com a gente pelo chat da Matrix. Então, olha, muito obrigado. Semana que vem tem mais live de segunda. Vamos dar uma folga, vai ser em português mesmo, para não ter o problema que a gente vai ter agora, que é começar a transcrição, tradução, legendagem. É uma pós-produção muito difícil de fazer. A gente está precisando de mãos. Aí, se você quiser ajudar, dá uma chegada lá no DebXP ou lá no curso GNU e, 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 e vai lá. Ó, eu posso traduzir, sei lá, 15 minutos dessa, dessa transmissão de 3 horas. Horas. Já ajuda, a gente passa um tempinho para você, tá? Eu vou passar uma, eu, eu vou passar isso para o YouTube. O YouTube vai quebrar o galho de fazer uma pré-transcrição para gente. Aí vocês podem basicamente corrigir esse trabalho. Vai ser muito mais rápido do que o trabalho da semana passada que eu já estou legendando. <risos> então, gente, olha, muito obrigado. Até a próxima e a gente vai se falando. Abração, fui.